Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second installment in our Black, Brown and Green Voices series. Uh, we have you all on mute right now, and we anticipate that we will keep you in that status. Can you hear me? Could I get some thumbs up to make sure everyone can hear me loud and clear? Great. It's a beautiful day here in New York City. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, please free, feel free to chat us and tell us where you are dialing in from uh, so we get a sense of our reach uh, here today uh, with today's programme. Uh, I have the pleasure and honour today of introducing you for those of you who are not familiar already uh, with a, a wonderful lady called Deidre uh, Humphreys Barker, who is the author of Mother of Orphans, The True and Curious Story of Irish Alice, A Coloured Man's Widow. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation uh, with Deidre today. Uh, I've had the honour and pleasure of having a couple of chats with her and actually interviewing her for our uh, Archives of Irish America, uh, which has kind of most recently been our uh, most active um, foray and conversation uh, with um, documenting the diversity of the Irish diaspora uh, in the United States and beyond. Uh, we'll follow up this event with um, an email uh, with some links um, uh, so that you can feel free to learn more about what we do at Luxman Ireland House. If you're not already a member of our community, welcome. Uh, please come back uh, and, and engage with us again. Um, we do a lot of different things in our little home uh, at the end of Fifth Avenue uh, on the NYU campus. And um, we're always delighted and hoping to expand uh, the reach of what we do in terms of scholarly engagement and cultural en engagement with uh, matters to do with Ireland, the Irish diaspora, and essentially the global Irish um, diasporic experience. The run of show today, folks, um, will be, as I mentioned, we're going to ask for everyone to remain on mute for the event. Um, I will, after this introduction, I'm going to hand over briefly to our wonderful Consul General uh, of Ireland here in New York, Kieran Madden, who has been a, a really stellar supporter of this project and the conversations around this from the get-go. Uh, Kieran's going to give a brief welcome, um, especially for the benefit of those who aren't uh, already familiar with uh, what we're doing here in terms of Irish New York uh, in activity in this regard. And um, then uh, we will, um, I'll open up the conversation with Deidre. She has kindly agreed to do um, two short readings from the book as well. And we're just going to have a kind of a free flowing conversation about the origins of her project and contextualizing, uh, in a sense, uh, the story as it begins with, um, you know, how she refers to as Irish Alice, her great grandmother. Um, I noticed the other day, Deidre, I didn't say this to you earlier when we were uh, warming up that uh, I noticed that May 16th, uh, 1913, so two days from tomorrow uh, in um, 1913, um, Alice, um, you know, made that decision or felt compelled to make the decision to place her children into an institution uh, which is re really the kernel of um, uh, your interest and, uh, and engagement with this project and how you disclose it over the generations um, gives for a fascinating read and I'm delighted and honoured to have the opportunity to share that story, your story and Alice's story and the people who came in between and uh, alongside Alice um, to shed light on not only the politics of race um, um, and but also um, issues of gender and how, uh, as women, even in the 21st century, contending with that um, balance in terms of education, employment, um, upward mobility, and the, um, the, the, the pull of, of motherhood and, and child rearing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, something I'm well familiar with myself. So I'm looking forward to those conversations. What we're going to do in terms of, Deidre would like um, to, 
in, in as much as is feasible to, to engage with questions uh, on uh, her topic. So what I, I'm going to ask you to do, folks, um, many of you are probably seasoned Zoomers by now, um, but if you're not, just to remind you that there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen. If you just click on to that, and my colleague Amber Celedonio uh, is um, the person you're going to be looking for. I think she may be the only Amber on this call. So please send your, um, privately send your chat to Amber um, and she's going to um, moderate the discussion for me so that we can um, get through hopefully as many questions as we can. We'll try and uh, not go any later than 2.30 if at all possible. Um, uh, so that's kind of the timeline of everything. So, um, without further ado, um, I guess I'll hand over now, Kieran. I see you there set up and maybe um, thank you for uh, being here with us again today. It's, it's such an honour to have you here, um, especially because your schedule is busy. Um, uh, so I'll hand over to you for now. And I will unmute you. Pro it probably helps. Thanks, Miriam. I'm delighted to join again for the um, Bluxford Ireland House Black, Brown and Green Voices series. I loved listening to and learning from Lenny Sloan, Lenwood Sloan here two weeks ago. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Deidre Humphreys Barker's story of, of her family and all that goes with that. Um, looking at the list of participants, I know we have some repeat customers from two weeks ago and lots of new uh, faces and probably voices in from Michigan. So. For the, for the repeat customers, forgive me if you hear again what you heard from me before. Um, the Irish government is delighted to support the work of Dr. Miriam Nahan Gray and of Glucksman Ireland House in exploring the history of the intersection of Irish Americans and African Americans. Um, the oral histories, I think, allow, allow Miriam to, through personal stories, illuminate much, much bigger national stories of society. Um, of US society, I think also of Irish society, both at home and overseas. And as mentioned here okay, two weeks ago, it, it has always been important, but it's increasingly important in Ireland, given, given the change in the makeup of Irish society, the change for the better, I should say, in the makeup of, the, of Irish society where one in six people uh, were not born on the island. And we need to figure out how to de deal with, with the change in society and learn from others. Um, Miriam and I started talking about this work, I think, about 18 months ago, and she was, of course, well advanced on the road of it at that stage. But what really struck me in the intervening period was, once you start the conversation with others about it, the, one, there were so many stories to tell. Two, there are so many others um, already doing work in this area of Irish American and African American intersections, and there are so many more who want to do so. I can see on the call here, Brian Dooley, who I know who's done uh, work in this area also. So the, and I say we heard from Lenwood Sloan, who has been uh, working with Mick Maloney on, on this material for, for decades at this stage, I think. And of course, in the last few months, we've seen the launch of the African-American Irish Diaspora Network. Um, so there, there is so much potential and there is no momentum, as I said before, and we're delighted to be a small part of it and to support us. Um, what Lenny Sloan reminded us of a couple of weeks ago is that not all the stories of the history of the Black Irish in the country start in dark places, even though we know a lot of them also, also do. But what he, alongside that, what he reminded us of is that even those that came from much more positive places face challenges because of politics and society. And that underlines the importance, I think, of the work that has been undertaken here and that we're delighted to support it. To move forward together, it is essential that we explore both the light and the dark sides of this combined history. And I know that Dr. Miriam Nighan Gray, as an utterly professional historian, is approaching it in that way. And that is how we will move forward and make the best use of these historical explorations. And I say again, we're delighted to be a small part of it. And if there are others out there who want to work with us in, in this area also, we will, of course, be delighted to do so. Thanks very much, Miriam. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so, uh, Deidre, um, you're there. Uh, welcome uh, and uh, wonderful to have you uh, here on the line with us loud and clear. 
uh, from Lans Lansing, Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you can hear me good, Deidre, and everything's good on your end. Oh, I need to unmute you. That always helps. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. It's so nice to be here with you today. And it has been um, fun working with you uh, on my book, you know, and I so appreciate your interest in, in it. it. It is very, um, well, you know, New York is the place and Irish are in New York and you're in New York. And for an author, it's just, it's just awesome to be doing something from New York. Well, I'm grateful because this, how we learned about what you were doing was from an email you sent to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Marion Casey, uh, about the intersection of family history and, um, and genealogy and how we can use um, family stories uh, and, and history to excavate some really uh, important and rich themes about the past. I guess, um, to, to kind of kick off the conversation, Deidre, for, for the people who haven't yet had the pleasure of reading uh, Mother of Orphans, uh, like I have, um, tell, us, uh, tell us a little bit, give us a little bit of context before, I think you're going to read from the book, but tell us a little bit about Alice, and I guess maybe, maybe I'd ask you to start with you knew her, and, and maybe start from there a little bit in terms of how this project uh, even originated? Well, I can do that. And I don't want to uh, tell you how to run your show, but you said you were going to read my bio for people who are- Oh, thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you for that reminder. That That's very good. Um, Deidre's uh, bio is actually on the back of the book, and this is it for anyone who hasn't um, uh, seen it yet. It's available through the University of Chicago Press, um, if people want to pick it up if they haven't already. Um, Deidre is a writer, journalist, and teacher who lives in Michigan. Her essays have appeared in uh, the Beijing of America, Personal Narratives About Being Mixed Race in the 21st Century, published in 2017, and have been published by the Society for the Study of Mis Midwestern Literature, uh, the Ohio and Michigan Historical Societies, and the National Trust for Historical Preservation. A Detroit native, Barker graduated from Wayne State University and studied at the Iowa Writers Workshop with James McPherson. Thank you for prompting me to, to do that because that's important. Um, so the floor is yours. <laughs> well, the um, Mother of Orphans, uh, the true and curious story of I, Rochelle as a colored man's widow, um, is about my great grandmother, Irish, uh, Alice Donlan. And she was a third generation Irish woman in uh, the United States. Her family was in Indiana on the uh, Ohio River. I was, uh, uh, and then the rest of the uh, book is um, four chapters from her black family. So there's Pauline, who was her sister-in-law. There's uh, her daughter, Polly, my grandmother. Um, her, her granddaughter, Mary Jane, who was my mother and myself. And what the book does is trace through our biographies, our stories, um, her legacy of making this very um, anguished decision in 1913 about her three children when she was widowed in 1912. So what, this, what the book shows, I think, is how that decision worked out over the long haul, so it goes really from her life and being born in 1875 until um, when I went to college in 1975, so about 100 years. And it looks at this decision. I make an argument that she made this decision based on her Irish values, and one of those was education. So what happened, um, for people who don't know or haven't had this happen in their family, is that um, uh, through a death, her husband, uh, she was left with the care of three children. Now, back at the beginning of the 20th century, there was no social security, there was no welfare, there was insurance, and perhaps she had some, um, but she didn't have a million dollars of it. So raising a child that was uh, 10 years old, eight years old, and two, 
was going to cause her um, a problem. She didn't have um, family because her family abandoned her when she married John Johnson, uh, a black man. She did have his family, the Johnsons, but their values differed in terms of how you handle this type of situation. So what happened, um, what, what used to happen was the woman would go home, the mother would go home to her family and then um, they would help her raise her children. Well, she didn't have her family. She did have three of his sisters living in the same town they lived in, Springfield, Ohio. But the way that the black family handled this, and it's, it's not particular to just black families, but the way that our black family handled this was that the oldest daughter would help her mother care for the children. So the mother could go to work, which she needed to do, even though her house was paid for. Um, it was, uh, she needed to buy food and she needed to buy clothes to send her children to school. Um, but who was going to watch her baby if her two children went to school? The oldest one was my grandmother, uh, Polly. So what had happened in the Black family, the same kind of situation happened in 1894. And um, they embraced uh, the orphan. And Pauline, one of John's sisters, she left school to raise this baby. She had care of the baby. They were, they were in her father's house and she, she was 12. Pauline was 12. And now she had a baby to take care of because somebody had to raise the child, be responsible. Her mother, the grandmother was sick. So this, this tradition of the oldest daughter um, helping to raise the younger, younger kids was very prevalent in, in our black family but not so much for Alice. So um, I had to do a lot of research to understand this because we didn't know any of this story. All I knew was um, my grandmother had been in an orphanage. And I learned this when um, Alice died in 1961 in Detroit. That's how I, how I knew her. She came to live with her daughter in Detroit, my grandmother. So, you know, we saw her, have a picture of her, um, of her celebrating Christmas with us. And, um, and then my, as I started to explore, my mother told me, oh yeah, grandma used to come and visit us all the time. She didn't live in Detroit with them. She lived in Canton, Ohio, but she did come and visit them. So it made sense at the end of her life that she would come and live in Detroit with, with her daughter. So let's go back, let me just go back a little bit in the story. So now we have two, two different families, of, uh, what we know as a white family, but what I discovered is, you know, at the beginning of the century is Irish, which was different from white. And we could talk about that later if you'd like. Um, but an Irish, Irish values and black values clashing in terms of how are we gonna help this family of children? How do we help this widow, this widowed mother with these three young children? And because they couldn't agree, and Alice stuck with her values, she put them in an orphanage. So now I'm thinking orphanage, as I get older and start to think about this orphanage, that doesn't make sense. Orphanage is like, for little orphan Annie, no parents, that's what it means. But here she was in 1961 when I was nine, living at my grandma's house. So obviously my grandmother wasn't an orphan in the way that I thought about it. So um, in my research, I discovered that there were different kinds of childcare available to, um, to people who were fortunate enough to um, be able to get in. So I think the argument I'm making in the book is that Alice put her children in the orphanage so that they could continue to go to school. That this is a, this is a strong Irish value and um, she acted on that and she was able to get her children into a children's home where she could come and visit them. 
She could take them out for lunch. They went on vacation. She kept up with um, their schooling and how they were living. She did not lose contact with her children. And as a result, my grandmother, the oldest of her children, graduated from high school in 1920. And so uh, as, we, as I look in this book at the role that education played in, um, in our lives, you come to me, um, the fourth generation, fourth generation, going to college, even though I had a child when I was 19 that didn't put a stop to my education, thanks to my mother. And, um, and I now have two degrees. I've been a journalist. I've taught college. I've worked at a medical school as an editor. You know, I'm a writer. I'm, that's my trade. I've been able to do this. And I think it's because she made that decision in 1913. To set the groundwork for um, contextualizing Alice's decision making in 1912, 1913, you went back to sources and have done quite a bit of digging in terms of contextualizing where she grew up and the community she grew up in. And I think that's the first place you want to read from, if I'm not mistaken, Deidre. Do you want to do that now? I would like to do that now. And um, I have to explain to um, my family who's on this call and new friends that I'm going to put on my glasses and I'm going to look like a pirate because <laughs> one of my, um, I was having some uh, surgery on my eyes, on both of them, cataract surgery, you know, they do it at one, one eye at a time. And um, they got one eye done, so this is my long eye, and but they didn't get this eye done, which is my reading eye, because of COVID-19. All elective surgeries were um, canceled. So this is how I have to maneuver with the computer now to block out one eye in order to see fine print. So that's it. I'm not a pirate. I'm, I'm caught in between surgeries. You look good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so what you need to know about this reading that I'm going to do is that Alice grew up in Lawrenceburg, Indiana on the Ohio River, Ohio um, River town, and it was German. And she attended St. Lawrence Church, Catholic Church, and it was founded by four German families and everything about it was German. They even taught the Pledge of Allegiance in German. It was a German dominated town. So, but she was Irish. Her people came from the hills above Lawrenceburg um, and that's where the Irish lived and the hills above Lawrenceburg. But her father and mother came down from the hills to live in the town and to work in industry and in factories because all the goods were delivered by riverboat to Lawrenceburg. So there was a lot of work for people in the cities. And we have seen over the um, century, more and more people going to cities for that very reason, leaving farms and coming into the cities where they can work. So the important part is that she is an Irish girl growing up in a German town. If Alice had been German, she might have had a chance with one of the Finch brothers of Lawrenceburg, identical twins whose father was the president of First National Bank. The brothers opened a hotel by the train station. Thomas Finch was elected mayor of Lawrenceburg and became a mortician. Along with the other girls, pretty Alice might have dreamt about these brothers, but with their German mother, any German mother, even a German Catholic mother welcome an Irish girl as a daughter-in-law and her family. That was nearly impossible. Alice had no prospects in Lawrenceburg. Unmarried at age 23, she was on the threshold of becoming a spinster. If she wanted to marry and have children, she needed to go elsewhere. So in 1898, at age 23, Alice left Lawrenceburg in search of her future. She could have gone to the hills to search for a husband. That's where her parents had been born and raised and where the Irish still live. But she was a city girl. So instead of getting on a buckboard wagon seat, she took a carpet bag to the train depot in downtown Lawrenceburg. 
The depot had a fine oak door with a beveled glass window like any other train depot. But it was strange because it crouched a few blocks up from the riverbank on William Street, half on the sidewalk, half in the roadway. In front of its silver streaks of steel rail created a street meridian on which passing horses tap dance. She boarded the train headed east. Those black iron horses of the Gilded Age seemed straight out of a Western movie, trumpet chimneys letting out clouds of white steam with curving cow catchers at the front fender. It would take her one state east, just around the bend of the Ohio River, 21 miles to Cincinnati, a powerhouse city of 300,000 residents. People commuted from towns like Lawrenceburg all up and down the riverbank to work in Cincinnati. It was the mecca of the region. Cincinnati offered something for everyone. Southerners crowned it the Queen City. Revelers dubbed it the Big Sinful City. The Urbane hailed it the London of North America. And for the stylish, it was the Paris of America. If Alice was going to find a husband, it would be there in the city in the bowl of the Ohio River Valley. Her journey ended in a barn of a station. It was the Little Miami Railroad Depot, a transportation palace more than 500 feet long that opened overhead to a very high ceiling that looked like an inside sky. It had more arches than a church and stained glass windows in the shape of peacock tail feathers. Cincinnati's Little Miami Station was as fancy as the city was daring. When Alice arrived, she more than likely wore the style of the day, a dark blue dress hem short to the ankle. Alice took note of the latest fashions because the husband she sought was someone who would want a modern woman who knew how to dress, could read and write and count money. When she left Lawrenceburg, a depression that had started in 1893 when she was 18 years old seemed never ending. But as she descended into Cincinnati's little Miami Railroad Depot, the recession was beginning to break. But how could anyone know that? The downturn had crippled small places like Lawrenceburg, but Cincinnati was a major city, the headquarters of Procter & Gamble. In 1898, Procter & Gamble was riding the huge success of ivory, the soap, so pure it flows. 99 and 44, 100% pure. If Alice was to catch a husband in Cincinnati, she needed to look desirable. She needed new clothes, shoes, hats, gloves, and the money to buy them. She needed a job. But by the turn of the 20th century, not only was the country in a recession, it was in the thralls of nativism. White people boiled with the anti- with an anti-Irish and anti-Catholic sentiment that could be traced back to the British Isles. The English hated the Irish, and in America, the Wash kept the Irish lower than second class and made them compete with Blacks for the lowest paying jobs. Alice's only option was to be a maid and provide menial labor in a white person's house. The English liked their Bridget's, the catch-all name for an Irish maid. To replace the term maid with the name Bridget was an insult that denied Irish women their individuality and dignity in America. Alice had to know the servant hierarchy. There were chambermaids, parlor maids, scullery maids, and laundry maids. They were called laundresses, and that was the worst of the maid's job. Joe Baker's novel, Longborn, appreciated that job from the point of view of a laundress employed in the Bennett household, the family at the center of Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice. The laundress worked with her hands in water and lye soap most hours of the day. Her hands became rough, blistered, chapped, chafed, and in winter, stricken with chillblains. Most laundresses were widows with children who did the work because it provided a steady income. Well over 20 years old, when she arrived in Cincinnati, Alice could not be a laundress marked by rough hands. She did not have enough time to raise the money for her true soul by washing clothes before she went looking for a man. 
So that sets the context for us, Deidre, so nicely read. It's always a pleasure to hear an author read uh, him or herself. Um, that sets the context of her move uh, to Cincinnati. And then in the course of, of, of your research, you um, map out and you're really reconstructing um, and, and someone has already asked a question you 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 relied heavily on census records and other kinds of um, documentation strategies uh, to see where Alice lived and um, to map out then her relationship uh, with um, Mr. Johnson and and you talk about you know the topography then they moved to Springfield Ohio correct which is about 90 miles from Cincinnati 90 miles north of Cincinnati and they you cut you talk about the they they um the Irish Hill area and can you contextualize a little bit what you've been able to reconstruct about how they met which I, I think probably wasn't uncommon um, and what you were able to uncover about their early lives together before his tragic passing? Well, you know, this is a question that my writers group asked me over, over several years when I was first getting started with this story, is how did a, a Irish woman and a black man get together in 1899? And I read that passage and described Cincinnati because Cincinnati is the place where they met. And it was such a wide open place. I mean, you can't even imagine if you look at Cincinnati today, except when you look at their um, buildings and those beautiful bridges that cross the Ohio River, how really rich this place was, how, uh, you know, it was, it was like they said, the Paris and the London and anything went. And it was a big drinking and entertainment place. Um, there were big German beer houses that people took their family to. There were um, bedding parlors, there were taverns, saloons, bars, all of these drinking places are different kinds of places. And they all existed in Cincinnati. And people were there just tr trying to make their way in this Mecca of America where uh, industry was happening and where she could get a job and he could, he could get a job. John Johnson came from Kentucky and um, they came to Ohio because of course it was the freedom land. He's first generation um, free. His father was enslaved, though he never um, would admit to that. <laughs> His father was enslaved. And um, they met at work. I asked my grandma that one day, Polly, I said, so how'd your parents meet? Because I, you know, I couldn't imagine where that was. And she was a maid in a great house, which is what they call um, these great big houses. We call them McMansions today, um, a little bigger than that. but. They call them great houses in Cincinnati. And she was a maid and he was the horseman. So they worked together. And so many couples, you know, have uh, like Sally Quinn and um, <laughs> the publisher of the Washington Post, they met at work. And so did Alice and John, they met at work. Um, but why would she be attracted to him? Well, again, it goes back to the Irish values. Irish people love horses. And he was the horseman. So his status was enhanced in her eyes because of the kind of job that he had at work. And then, so that's where they got together in Cincinnati. Um, and their first child um, was born in Cincinnati. And then um, shortly thereafter, they left and moved to Springfield um, to join his family who left Cincinnati um, and went and lived in Springfield. Springfield was another one of these booming places um, at, the, at the beginning of the industrial age. Had all kinds of factories. The main thing they had was they made farm implements. And it causes me to say that, since, that uh, Springfield is the place that makes useful things that we use every day, like today they make brooms. 
But back when Alice and John arrived there at the beginning of the 20th century, they made farm equipment and together the um, factories in, in Springfield, together with factories in Chicago, came together in what was called a combination. Today we know it as a cor corporation to form International Harvester. So that is how big this, this Springfield is. And um, they also um, were conveniently located for Crow Publishing. And Crow Publishing at the beginning of the century had their editorial offices in New York, but their big printing plant was in Springfield, Ohio. And they ran a printing plant 24 hours of the day. They had a post office inside of their printing plant so they could mail all these magazines that they published straight out of the factory. So Springfield was another place where there was opportunity for, um, for people and that's why they went there. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering, Deidre, if I would we'd take the opportunity to show that first photo you wanted to share and maybe you can contextualize a little bit. I mean, if I can summarize and correct me if I'm, you know, please correct me, but my from my reading of the book and my conversations with you, um, Alice and John are living a relatively comfortable life. Um, in that period, uh, you know, in Springfield, and uh, you, you draw out very nicely how uh, they're kind of navigating for themselves um, in certain ways in terms of decisions about education for the kids and stuff like that. Um, a, pr a functional and positive kind of experience as a biracial family in that setting. And then tragedy strikes. Um, uh, with the death of 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 um, your great grandfather, do you want me to pull up that photograph and maybe? You... Yes, I can speak to that. So this this photograph was taken on the day of John Johnson's funeral in front of their in front of their house, and Alice is, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is Alice right here. And these are their three children. That's Elizabeth in her arms, um, Polly and um, Elmer called Bud. And these black women are John Johnson's sisters. So he died and her inheritance was six black women to try to get along with them and raise these children. Now you talk about, um, you mentioned that they were pretty self-sustaining. Um, John's father, uh, Isaac, was a mason, so he um, was in the construction trades, and the way that John Johnson made his way, he cobbled together a living from the things that he liked to do, such as um, taking care of horses and um, dogs. He had fighting dogs, um, which was legal in that day, so from bedding and from um, he was a bartender in Springfield, but he also was a contractor. And he con contracted um, to get uh, jobs done. And he and his father and his friends, his skilled trades friends, built this house for um, Alice. And this is a, how the house was paid for free and clear when he died of congestive heart failure in 1912. And um, so she didn't have to worry about that. She didn't have to worry about paying rent. But, you know, kids eat every day, three times a day, and um, they need clothes and they need new shoes. I mean, that's a, that's a whole uh, <laughs> good luck wish when you're gambling, throwing dice like, baby needs new shoes, right? And so now she had to figure out a way to um, care for her children and uh, buy the necessary things that they, that they needed. So um, some people might think that it's a little morbid to take a picture on um, the day someone dies, but for many families, that was a family reunion, uh, a funeral. In fact, these sisters standing right adjacent to Alice and behind the children 
these women did not live in uh, Springfield. The, these three did. This is Pauline right here. This is um, Lucy and Nellie. And they lived there, but these did, these did not. And um, so they took pictures when they came. Now in the book I explained, some people look at this picture and they first say, this woman here, Alice is a, this is a white woman? And so what you have to understand is that photography was in its early development then, and the photographer would need to set the aperture for someone in the picture. Now it's nice if everybody is the same color because what photography is doing is manipulating the light. Um, but these people are all different colors and many black families are, you know, they range from very light, um, like Alice, white and light like me, to very dark um, people. And the way that um, that usually would work out is they would set the aperture for the light people. And so black people would come off and they, in the picture, they wouldn't have eyes or noses or mouths and, um, and they would be ink spots and nobody liked that. So the important part about this picture because we can't see the fe features on the black women is that the undertaker would have the photograph taken. And so the photographer, he understands who his um, client is, it's who he needs to please. He needs to please these six black women here, the sisters of the deceased. So he set the aperture for them so that they would come out clear in the picture. And then that's why the picture looks like that. So. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for showing that. I appreciate that. It's such a great photo and um, I, th I feel like we could deconstruct the body language and as you say, how the, the, the more neutral sisters in terms of uh, family relations were closer to Alice. She was holding the baby and then the other um, sisters with whom she had a more fraught relationship um, were further away. Um, so this is 1912 when that photo is taken um, and essentially Deidre, you know, like when I heard about the book first and I think, you know, um, having read the book, um, it was kind of your initial perception as well for a long time was, um, you know, a pretty, you know, how, how could this woman give up her children? And essentially what you're doing in the book, starting off with contextualizing Alice's decision making is that that focus on education and that you you're bringing through with um Pauline and Polly with your mom Mary Jane and into yourself um for the benefit of people first engaging with the book um so tell me about what you've constructed in terms of her logic and and how she would have place them there in May 1913 and how you think that that is that really paid off then in the future generations? Well I, I think that um, there's this year gap between the time that her husband dies and she puts her children in um, the Clark County Children's Home and I think she was just making it the best way that she could um, maybe some days Polly stayed home to watch the little girl. Maybe some days Alice stayed home. She went to work, she went back to work as a hotel maid. Um, uh, she went to work as a hotel maid and so she had long shifts, she had to go to work. And I, I imagine it, it that she maybe went to work on the night shift and tried to um, manage it in that way, that, that her children would be asleep while she was at work, and then when she came home, she could stay up, and then Polly and Bud could go to school, and then um, when they came home, she could go to sleep, and they could watch Elizabeth, the baby, and, you know, women, uh, even today, have to cobble together child care the best way they can. Um, it's very expensive. Um, my my uh, son and daughter-in-law, they have um, one in shock here today. Well, not today, but before COVID-19 and hopefully soon. Uh, <laughs> $800 a month this costs. 
So that, and this has been pointed out in several articles that who can afford that? Educated professional women can perform, afford that $800 a month. Everybody else is asking their mom if they can help out, asking their friends if they can help out. Maybe one day your friend next door, your neighbor says, I can watch them today because I'm on vacation. Or and then maybe next time you have to ask your cousin. And maybe you have to get your grandma or your great grandma, you know? It's hard. it's hard. So that's the situation and the circumstance that Alice was in in 1912. Um, so when she saw that wasn't going to work, because she has to sleep too, right? Um, she had to look around for some alternative. She was not, her and her sister-in-law were not getting any closer on a um, solution, obviously. We know this by the outcome. And, and in their defense, like I started off with the story thinking that the black women were the villains, they wouldn't help this woman, but they were all maids too. That's the work they did. So they had to go to work as well. Pauline was in a little better situation. Um, she was married, her husband owned a house before they got married and she moved in there. She was able to do church work and have a strong relationship with her, with her church. Um, but she worked as well. She was a maid. She was childless. So, of course, she welcomed the children in her home, her nieces and nephews. She welcomed them there. And she, I think, helped, was able to help more than anyone else. So it's that ability to be able to provide people help with their children. But she had to go to work. And then her husband got sick. And he died within um, three years of John Johnson's death. Her husband died as well. And so, you know, the times were pretty discouraging for people. You know, a folk died early and um, there, was nothing, there was nothing you could do about that but, but keep going, just keep going forward. And that's a saying in my family, just keep moving forward, keep moving forward. So why, but why would Alice think that this was okay? Well, because the Catholic Church took care of Irish people. So this whole idea of an institution helping families um, when they needed help was familiar to her. Um, think about all the institutions that the Catholic Church runs, hospitals, schools, you know, orphanages. Um, not so much in Ohio, it was public, but in New York, you know, the, the, um, my, my uh, research showed me there was a big battle in New York with the Catholic Church over the orphanages and the prejudice against the Irish. So much to the point that um, people did not want their tax dollars used to help Irish people. So they paid the Catholic Church to take care of these kids. Um, so why wouldn't Alice think that this was okay? Institutions are supposed to help you. And um, when she found that one that she could get her children into, and it was a countywide system in Ohio, and the key is that she could get them in. Because this was, uh, there were many people who, who needed help with their children. And she was able to get her children in, in there and continue to see them, so. Did I, did I answer your question? Absolutely, Deidre. And my understanding then of the trajectory for Alice, you know, um, initially when I came to the story as well, I'm envisioning a woman dumping her children in an institution and then taking off and living the high life. My understanding is she works in a, host, no, a hotel until 1929, which is interesting timing in terms of the depression. There's probably an influence there maybe in terms of employment. And then from 1929 until she retires in the late 50s or early 60s, she's working in a hospital. Is that right? A hospital in Canton, Altamont Hospital. And she was the longest serving employee there. She died when she was 87, 1875 to 1961, 86. And um, the spring before she died, she's in a picture, an employee appreciation dinner picture 
800 years of service and she's got like almost uh, 50 years of that herself. So she was a hardworking woman and um, she only quit working when she had to. And that's when she came to Detroit and lived with um, her daughter, Polly. So um, the key to your research and engagement on all this was your grandmother and getting her permission and and uh, to access records and and stuff like that and i think that um that introduces the next reading that you would like to do is that right it does introduce the next reading and I appreciate you um, bringing that up. I do want to say that uh, while this, my grandmother giving me permission to look at her records at the Clark, Clark County Children's Home um, in Springfield, Ohio, it was, it was key for insight into how the children's home worked. It was not the first thing that I did. The first thing I did was look at the census and try to place people in the particular places. And I was, um, though I knew what I knew was that she had been in an orphanage. The first person I found in the orphanage was her sister Elizabeth in 1920. Because um, when the census is taken, as we're in the census process right now, they go to these institutions like a nursing home, wherever the person um, lives, and they record you there where you are. So I found Elizabeth first, and then I thought, well, I wonder if, uh, I wonder if Polly was in this same one, and that's why, um, that's why I got um, permission from her. Um, what you need to know about this next reading is uh, who the people are. There are several people here. Um, one, you've heard me talk about Bud, um, who is um, Alice's uh, son, and then and Elizabeth, who's her daughter, and then Polly is at the center of this reading. But my two uncles, Polly's um, two sons, are also in this reading, and one is uh, named Sonny. He's the older son and Buddy, who was also um, named Elmer, which Elmer, by the way, as far as uh, I can see in my research, comes from the Irish side of our family. So we had um, two, three, three generations of Elmers, and, um, but this Elmer, my, my uncle, he's, his name, we call him Buddy. Okay. So I probably waited just as long as I dared before getting started with the research and the how and why Alice put Polly in the orphanage. In 1994, Polly was 92 years old. Her mother, Alice, was dead three decades and her sister, Elizabeth, dead 18 years. Her brother, Bud, died before the both of them. But no one on the black side of the family really knew when Bud died. He was married to an Italian woman at the time of his death and living on Detroit's far east side nearby to his wife's family. Mary Jane remembered he was buried before they called anyone but his mother Alice. Bud's Italian in-laws had not wanted his black family to attend the service. So um, I found Polly's younger sister Elizabeth in the 1920 U.S. Census of the Clark County Children's Home. And I wondered, had Polly ever lived there? I had mentioned this to my uncle, Sonny, when he returned to Detroit during the summer from the West Coast where he lived. I had shown him the agency's permission slip. I do not think I asked him to ask Polly for permission for me, but he asked me to meet him at the nursing home. Three of them waited for me, one I had not expected and perhaps did not want to see, not today. He was my other uncle, Buddy. A common, uh, his name was Elmer, which is a common 19th century name. It came down from the Irish side of our family. Fastidious in appearance, Buddy was as lean as he had been in the Air Force 40 years earlier. His skin was toasty brown and his hair straight, thick, and black. He looked Egyptian, similar in appearance to the actor Omar Sharif, uh, and, and looked exactly like my grandfather. Neither man talked much. My grandfather used silence to his advantage as a Detroit police officer. His son, Buddy, was a dentist. 
I knew that with family, Buddy measured his words. But of course, there had been a good chance Buddy was in town. It's two o'clock. Sorry. He always came from New York to visit when his older brother Sonny was in Detroit. I had nothing to feel uneasy about, though. I was not there to get my grandmother to sign away her, her deed to a gold mine, but I felt a little bit ganged up on, as if just wanting to know Alice's secret jeopardized my place in our family. I wondered how the secret had affected my life. In a sense, I was going through life blind, unaware of what made me, me. I needed to know Alice. So Sonny and Buddy and Grandma waited in the hallway outside of her room at the nursing home. The brothers had pulled three big chairs together and put their mother in the middle. She was a short, stout woman, half, half white. She had soft hair with lazy curls. Some years it had been ribs fashionably blue. In the nursing home, it was iron gray and white pepper. Her feet rested on a box because they did not reach the floor. With her two sons on hand, she was happy. It did not matter where she was if her sons were nearby. She doted on them, just as her, her daughter Mary Jane doted on her sons. Perhaps that came from the Johnson family, where only one son, John Johnson, had survived. Hello, Deidre, Polly greeted me. Her voice had a sing-song quality as it cut out the second vowel of my name to arrive at the correct pronunciation, Deidre. Hi, Grandma. I kissed her cheek. Her skin felt like papyrus. My Uncle Sonny was soft and jovial. He wore a casual shirt like he was playing tennis later on. We shared hugs and greetings all around. When we hugged, Buddy only said, Deidre. The permission slip was in my bag, but I made no move for it. Better to play this by ear. I wondered if they had talked about this before I arrived. We all knew why I had driven 90 miles from my home in Lansing to meet them in Detroit, and I was glad Sonny was helping me. I did not think Buddy approved of what I wanted to do. He was a private person, certain in his ideas when he expressed them. If asked a direct question, his first response was usually no. Or he might laugh while backing away and holding out two hands, palms up, which was, again, no. Was my Uncle Buddy going to leave me stranded without my history, orphaned? Sonny leaned over to Polly. Mama, Deidre wants to look into what happened in Springfield. Is that OK, Ma? His tone was kind, like that used by a professional. He was a social worker by education and profession, and he was the oldest son, the most powerful person there. I kept my mouth shut. Polly did not answer right away. She looked down at her white hands in her lap, then up at me. At age 92, the skin on her face hung loose, but her eyes shone sharp and clear. She looked to Sonny, who smiled, and then at Buddy, who said nothing. All right. Polly said, finally. Her voice was strong, but not loud. My anxious ears heard it as, all right, I understand, not all right, yes. I gave Sonny the permission slip. It was for the orphanage in Springfield, the Clark County Children's Home. He put the piece of paper on the tabletop in front of Polly. If you sign this, Ma, she can look at records about you. Polly would do whatever her eldest son asked of her. The tables haven't been re reversed in their relationship. Sonny held out a pen to her. I held my breath and avoided Buddy's stare. She had researched her grandfather's military service in the Civil War, and undoubtedly Polly had her reasons for not researching her own life. What the reasons were, I did not know or knew if she still held them. I watched her with the pen. She gripped it. I kept my eyes on Polly. She lowered the pen to the paper and looping the ink signed her name, Pauline Johnson Lay. It took strength from my grandmother to weave black ink into a key to the past and give it to me. Sonny picked up the authorization and handed it over to me and my heart soared. I'm going to use the opportunity to share this other photo just so people can um, 
see some of the put some uh, names to the faces or whatever way that phrase is. Can um, so that's um, can you point out who people are there or tell us who people are? Alice. And this, this is Christmas uh, 1957. This is Alice. This is Polly, her daughter. <clears throat> this is Ellen Elizabeth, who was named for Alice's mother. Um, we called her Patty. That's my um, Polly's daughter, my mother's sister. And this is my youngest, um, my next younger brother, Andrew. So I do remember this Christmas. I don't know who this, what baby this is back here. My mother had 13 children, so it gets kind of hard to keep track of them. But I think this picture shows that Alice was a part of our life um, and that she, didn't, she never abandoned her family, um, even though it is odd to understand on the face of it why she put her children in um, an orphanage. It, you know, it often takes some research to figure out what is going on even in our own families. Um, I think, Deidre, we, um, it, it's a good time for us um, to go to some questions. And I think one in particular that has come in, um, if you might like to comment on, was anyone in the family resistant to your discoveries? Did they feel it was an aspect of their lives that created a dissonance of how they felt about their current identity in the context of the community that they identified with? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, we are clearly African-American. Um, my grandmother, Polly, she chose to be Black. Um, my husband and I argued about this several times in the kitchen over the years about what's is it, is it school and all that stuff you could give them or is it knowing that they're loved? And I think what my grandmother showed um, that in the extended family, all she saw was black people and that she equated that with love. So she went, so that's what she did. Um, it wasn't, it, it was, wasn't as important in Springfield because she had a little different kind of situation. She left the orphanage and went to work um, in a, a rich family's house. As a matter of fact, she um, lived in the house of Jonathan Winters' grandparents, the comedian Jonathan Winters. Um, but then when she graduated high school, she uh, came to Detroit where um, her aunts were. So were people resistant? Um, my uncle Sonny, he, he did not have a lot of sympathy for his grandmother. And um, there's a little piece that he wrote in my book about how he wonders about why he, he saw her as being distant um, and that she didn't pay attention to her grandchildren. Um, so he, when I first started doing this, he said, well, he said, I don't know. He said, but look, you research it and you come up with um, the story that you think it is. And then, uh, you know, uh, the rest of us can look at it and we can determine whether or not um, this is the case. I'm getting a, a message that my internet is connection is unstable. So um, I hope it doesn't go out. Um, so uh, among the rest of us, I don't know if we had any particular feeling about my great grandmother. Um, I th we wanted to know more. We're not a family that sits around and rehashes the past. Um, we're very much in the moment and very much about what we're doing. Um, so I think this is this book was um, um, warmly received by my family because it just has all this information and this story that we didn't know anything about. Um, did uh, there's a question here? Uh, someone had asked a question about whether you had looked at the 1920 and 1940 census. I, I think from reading the book, you can tell that you did a lot of uh, diving into census records. How did you handle um, the experience? I guess this person means about writing the book and researching it from a, a mental health and self care perspective. You know, did it challenge you in any way in terms of? Um, yourself as a person, did it affect you? Um, um, and how does that, um, has that, um, the sometimes the tension between, um, you know, how 
bla the black experience and the Irish experience have been kind of pitted often in a conflict, kind of in terms of conflict. Has that evolved over time with your research? I'm paraphrasing here um, this question and I hope I'm conveying it uh, accurately. Um, did I have a, a crisis of identity behind this? No, I don't think I did, but it was nice to know um, the other part of this story. It was nice to know um, that my name is a derivative of Deirdre, um, which is an Irish uh, um, <laughs> a legend goddess, an adventurous. It was nice to know that. It was nice to know, you know, why I like green so much. Um, uh, I was a professor at uh, the local community college for many years, didn't realize how many green clothes I had until a student asked me, like, is that the only color you have in your wardrobe? And I was like, oh, really? I like green. Mm -hmm. um, it did kind of, it, it did make me look back on the way that I grew up um, being a little afraid of white people, but it also made me realize that we, we've always had white women in our family. Alice was the first, um, not, not the last, but Kim Kardashian is one who was in our family and she's more Armenian. That's how my book starts out with um, saying that Kim Kardashian was not the first white woman to marry into our family. She married um, my uh, nephew, Chris Humphreys, NBA player, retired now for 72 days. But th this is like not a thing <laughs> for us to be excited about. It's, th it's just a part of the way our family is constructed. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions, Deidre, that came in um, was actually um, from Margaret Lynch Brennan, who's written um, quite a lot actually about domestic servants and women, about the fact that it wasn't a Catholic institution, which I think you referenced a little bit um, that she put the kids into, in part maybe because the network of Catholic institutions in that area may not have been as robust as it might have been, for example, in New York. But also, it is interesting to clarify, my understanding is that Alice really rejected the, the Catholic Church as an institution in terms of her own identity and practice in as much as you can reconstruct, correct? That's correct. Um, she did in, uh, on Irish Hill, you asked about this earlier, when they did build their house in Springfield, they built it on Irish Hill. So obviously she was longing in some way to be back with her, with her um, people and her husband being a loving husband, he built the house where she wanted to, to live. But St. Joseph's Catholic Church was just a couple of blocks away from their house and she did not attend there and she did not send her children to um, the parish school, the parochial school. Um, she sent them to public school and um, she did not have her children baptized. So my, gra uh, my grandmother was first baptized in uh, Detroit at uh, Macedonian Baptist Church following the black family. So, but at the end of her life, Alice did um, come back to the Catholic Church. She attended St. Cecilia's in Detroit, and she walked there from uh, her daughter's house. It was about a mile, and um, it was that devotion to church that really led to the injury that she died from. Someone knocked her down in the street trying to snatch her purse, and she broke a hip. And she was already fragile and she did not recover from that. So, um, I, you know, I think her, her story does show that at every point in life that people's values that they are raised with continue to come into their life and influence their decisions. And um, the fact that she was raised in the Catholic Church, even though she um, was mad at, mad at them be, um, because she couldn't get a marriage license, I did not find one for her in the Catholic Church or in the public record. Um, I think that's why she abandoned it, but she did come back to the church in the end. Um, since writing and undertaking the research, have you found a shift in your own emphasis and perspective on family and education and the way you navigate and appreciate them in your day-to-day -day life? I think 
I think the answer would be yes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I don't know if it was that big of a shift because um, the because this value came down through my mother's mother's mother, you know, and um, it was already there. The the thing I think it clarified for me um, was that m me and my twelve sisters and brothers and my mother and father putting the emphasis on going to school. Um, it, did, it didn't start with the civil rights era. It didn't start there. That this was already in our family and this would have happened regardless of whether or not civil rights was there. Civil rights supported it um, in our family and made it possible for all of us to go to school. And we went to all kinds of different schools. I went to Wayne in Detroit. My older sister went to Wayne. Um, my younger brother, one of my younger brothers went to Wayne. Um, five of my brothers played Big Ten football, three at Michigan, one at Iowa, one at Minnesota. And so, you know, scholarships and really pursuing education held our family in good, good steed. At the University of Michigan, we're like eight, Ann Arbor campus, we're like eight graduates from that school. Um, so, and everybody's expected to go to college. It doesn't just end at high school. So I think it was there, but this let me know that the, the origin of that value goes, for us, goes way back. It goes far back in our history. And um, one person has asked, uh, Deidre, did you ever wonder why or th did the notion of Alice living with one of her sisters-in-law, as I'm asking that question, <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I guess that probably wasn't uh, uh, something that was considered or may not have been palatable, right? Well, I don't know. I always thought there was a little bit of tension between them. I write in the book that I could never, um, as a kid, could never associate um, uh, Alice with Pauline, but but this person who's asking the question, they they could write the help me write the novel version because when I wrote the novel version, that was a solution that Alice suggested to her um, sister-in-laws. But the only one who was really available for that was an unmarried sister, the youngest one, Nellie. And, um, and she was trying to get married because, you know, for women, that's really what it came down to. Um, are you going to be able to land a husband? And that's what um, motivated Alice. I mean, that was something you were expected to do. If not, you were a failure, you were a spinster, and all these other, you know, names that people have for unmarried women. Fortunately, that's changing. But in my um, novel, I did imagine that them kicking that idea around, and then it just, you know, it just didn't, it didn't work. Because, as I said, values drive what we do, and um, for the Black family, it just didn't, it didn't make sense to send this 10-year-old to school when she was obviously needed at home. And it wasn't just the Black people. Um, Jacob Rice, he wrote um, the book, um, How the Other Half Lived, and he took pictures in the ghettos of New York of the European immigrants. And he has picture after picture of little girls with babies on their hips. That's not their baby, that's their mama's baby. And they are taking care of the, that child. They're called little mamas. And there's a picture of one in my book. And I think that this, this is what also frightened Alice because that book, people never lose their fascination with it. That book is available today and it was published in 1890. You can go right online and order that book. So what happens with um, children and, and how they're taken care of and who takes care of them continues to be a, a, a issue in our country and of high, of high interest as well. I'm going to call out the last question here um, that I have and then I'm going to break with the protocol and um, Lenwood Sloan who kicked off this series so fabulously has a question and after I ask this question, I'm going to call on Lenny. I'll unmute him 
uh, to let him ask the, the last question before we close out with some thank yous and some information. Um, so I'm giving you a heads up there, Lenny, if you want to. You don't have to turn off the video if you're in your pajamas or something, but I'll find you and I'll unmute you. But the last question I have here is, um, do you think that Pauline, are, um, that uh, I guess it would have been Polly, um, actually, your grandmother did not raise her children in the Catholic Church because of her mother's experience? Um, actually, we're Episcopalian, and um, that's so very close to Catholicism. I, I, I think maybe, you, maybe the um, questioner is right, that she didn't go over to the Catholic Church um, because of her mother's ambivalence about it, that she wasn't sent a positive message. Not because black people weren't Catholics, because they were. Um, but she, her, she first went to the Baptist church because her black aunts were, and were Baptists. And so she went to church with them. But when it was time for her to make a decision about what her family was going to do, she um, knew a woman, and this is described in the book, uh, Beulah Carter, and they had founded a Episcopal church on the west side, and, um, and this little church was just getting started, and so Polly took her family there, and that's where my mother grew up, and that's where I grew up. The church is still there, St. Cyprian's. Lenny, such a pleasure to have you with us. Um, I'm trying to unmute you there. Huh, why isn't that letting me? Can you unmute yourself, Lenny? How about Hello? that? Yeah, perfect. Okay. First of all, I'm going to hold up my copy of the book and tell everybody to get it. And it's a very fascinating read. I'm now going through the second read of it to mark it up because I always write in my books and like the Catholic nuns told me not to do. Um, so I had a question, I had two questions. The first when you, uh, you, start, uh, you kind of answered that I need to go back. Was, uh, was she and her husband married in the Catholic church? And uh, would you uh, expand on your answer about their marriage being recognized and recorded in the, in the Catholic Church? Um, well, thank you for that question. And thank you so much for coming on. I so enjoyed your presentation on this series um, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I'm very honored that you would come to mind and ask me a question. Thank you so much. Um, I could not find any evidence that they were married legally. Uh, I looked in the um, Hamilton County, which is Cincinnati, looked in their clerks, I looked clerk's office, I looked at the Ohio History Center. Ohio is fabulous about their um, records, their historical records. Um, I couldn't find any, uh, anything there. I looked at the Catholic Church and the diocese. I asked at um, the Catholic churches and Cincinnati, I could not find anything. So no, there was no evidence of that sort that they were legally married. But on the census in 1910, when the census officer came to their house, he recorded that she was white and he was black. And when they were asked how long had they been married, the answer was 18, that they had been married 11 years, which takes them back to 1899. So in, in, some, in some ways, that's where they married. The census, the government married them by recording their marriage. And that was in 1910. They had like an eight-year-old. They had three, three kids at that point, three, three, uh, eight-year-old, uh, six-year-old, and a baby. So, and they were living openly. And um, so, yes, they were married in that sense. They, what they call a common law marriage, which is a scandal, right? <laughs> a scandal at that time. And um, in my novel version, I do talk a little bit about, well, no, not a little bit. There's a big Christmas scene where this is revealed um, that this is the reason why they don't go to church is because the church wouldn't marry them, so. Um, uh, did I ask you a question? I'm going to mute myself here. 
So my la uh, the second part of my question was you were very articulate about the identification uh, with black. We've been talking, Miriam and I, about race uh, versus identity versus cultural. What has the revelation about that part of you, which is Irish, meant to you in your life? And how does it inform the work and the direction that you go in? You know, what, it, what ha it has done is to help me to identify some of the, uh, my family cultural practices that didn't make sense because they were not like my friends who were from the South. We had different food. We ate a lot of potatoes and we ate a lot of, we ate ham and uh, chicken. We ate pudding. None of my friends ate pudding, like chocolate pudding, like custard kind of pudding. And our food was bland. And then imagine the, the <laughs> we got a long line of, of women in our family who cooked this bland food, um, married to soul food black men. And, and I, I saw how, to, I got this in my uh, book where my father and my mother are talking about food. And, and uh, one time she serves him some tuna fish and my father looks at that and says, uh, that's party food. <laughs> Where's the rest of the food? So we had that, that was the main thing um, that it helped, it helped me to understand about my uh, ident identity. Thank you, Lenny. Um, Deidre, this has been a real treat um, and I really want to thank you. I'm so glad that you sent that email uh, to Mary and Casey months ago. So we became aware of what you're doing and your generosity already by allowing me interview you for uh, the Archives of Irish America for this brown, black and green voices collection and to have an opportunity um, to uh, virtually showcase uh, your book in this way has been one of the blessings of this uh, weird world that we're uh, living in uh, right now. Um, just my, our, our, uh, an alumna of our program and a great friend of mine, uh, Kate Fury, asked a question there about, and I am just want to sneak that last one in, um, did you ever find a baptismal record for Alice herself, um, Deidre? Yes, I did. Um, at St. Lawrence Church, the, okay. um, the secretary sent it to me. Yes, I did. Okay, so she was baptized herself, which uh, would be in keeping with the tradition of the community. Um, before we wrap up, um, almost we're um, almost on time, and um, I want to thank uh, my colleagues uh, at Luxman Ireland House, Amber and David, uh, for their help today. Um, the director of Luxman Ireland House, Professor Kevin Kenny, who's always such a great supporter um, of programming ideas in this vein. Of course, Kieran Madden um, and the team at the Consul uh, General of New York, they're just invaluable supporters of what we're doing. Um, this event and this series is co-sponsored in collaboration with New York Public Library's uh, Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. We're absolutely delighted uh, to engage with uh, you and your community and thank you to Sonia for your help and your suggestions for someone to interview for this collection. We're very, very grateful and we hope that it um, builds on further collaborations. Um, I also want to thank the people who've contributed to the archive already. Some of you I can see are here online with us and we're delighted um, to see you here um, engaging with the community more and more and please uh, spread the word. Um, I, th this uh, programming is also building on a wonder develop wonderful development uh, in the last couple of months. The African American Irish Diaspora Network, um, who, uh, which is also a co-sponsor for this series, has been founded by a gentleman called Dennis Brownlee. Um, Dennis, I think you're on the line with us from DC today. Um, welcome and thank you for being here. Um, um, I'll just unmute you, Dennis, and say a proper hello and so people can put a face to the name if anyone wants to find out information about the network. Uh, Dennis is the man. Uh, hi, Dennis. 
Hi, Miriam. Thank you. And uh, this is such a wonderful series. Uh, Deidre, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just found it uh, captivating hearing about your heritage. And these are the stories that we really want to hear more of. And thank you for, uh, for, sh for sharing your story with us. Thanks, Dennis. And apologies that I called on you there without notice, but um, we're, it's always great to have an opportunity to say a virtual hello and thank you for being here again and for the thank work you. of the network. I'm, I'm delighted and honoured to be um, involved in it. Um, we will have one more um, event in this series on June 4th. Uh, Professor Christine Keneally, who has uh, published extensively on, um, most recently, she's, she's a renowned scholar of the Irish famine, um, and she has done some fabulous work looking at Frederick Douglass in Ireland, and um, hopefully um, we'll, we'll have some programming um, in the fall uh, coming out of the African American Diaspora Network to look at that. But Christine's new book, which will be published by Routledge, um, actually this month, and we'll be uh, chatting with her on on June 4th. It looks at black abolitionists in Ireland in the 19th century um, and I think we're going to focus in for that conversation on uh, giving a shout out to one of the female um, abolitionists uh, who, who, who made that journey and um, so very much looking forward to that and hoping that some of you uh, may be able to join us. Um, Deidre has done a fabulous job. I mean, we do this kind of work through our oral histories and um, it's the kind of intersecting of family history and contextualizing it in a wider way. And um, this is such a great example. Not everybody goes off and writes a book on it. Um, and we're just delighted that uh, Deidre has done this and um, that we can showcase the finished product and uh, I'm, I have to say, I'm looking forward to the novel now at this point after hearing that you're, you're that in, pro in progress too. Um, thank you for bringing this connection to us, for bringing all this Michigan tribe and keep spreading the word about um, what we're trying to do in these conversations in terms of ensuring that we're looking at the experience of whiteness and specifically Irishness, but we're really talking about issues to do with um, you know, whiteness in the United States and beyond, how we can look at them in, in, in innovative and diverse ways um, and not be limiting ourselves in terms of how we are defining sensibilities of identity. Um, so um, please, I'd encourage you to um, uh, pick up the book. It's um, most easily accessible right now through the University of Chicago Press. Um, there, um, and and uh, Lenny is holding it up there like we are, and, and thanks again, Lenny, for being here and for um, letting us uh, build on the work that you and Mick Maloney have been doing for, for so long in this realm. Uh, we are recording this event, folks. We'll make it available on YouTube, so if any of your friends have missed this, uh, please let them know um, that it is available. And, um, and again, I want to sign off by thanking my husband, uh, who's taken off with our two biracial kids out to the playground, uh, so I can have a nice quiet space here uh, to do this interview with Deidre today. And thank you for gathering together in this virtual way. And thank you, Deidre. I hope you're happy with how that conversation went today. Thank you, Miriam. This has been wonderful. I, and I so appreciate everyone's interest and your, your continued interest. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>